Good evening and welcome to everybody for our first Book Cup session of 2021. We're finally in this year and we're starting on a fantastic note because we wanted to, when we started this book club, uh, engage with South Asian writers from across all of the nations. And I'm really happy today to have Moni with us, who is not Indian, but is from Pakistan. And I'm really happy to, that she has the time to be with us with well, her new novel. And Gayatri, thank you for being with us as well. I'm going to uh, read both of your bios and then hand it over to you. And uh, hopefully we can hear um, a little bit from the novel in Moni's voice herself. So Moni Mohsin is an author and journalist born and raised in Pakistan, but now lives between Lahore and London. Her journalistic career started at the Friday Times, which is Pakistan's first weekly newspaper, where she started her long running satirical and hilarious column, The Diary of a Social Butterfly. Now she works as a freelancer and she writes on culture, politics, lifestyle, class and society. Her writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Times of India, 1843, Vogue, Prospect and The Nation. Her two novels before this one are titled The End of Innocence and Tender Hooks, and I recommend both very highly. And her collected columns are The Diary of a Social Butterfly and The Return of the Butterfly. Today's novel, well, today the novel we're going to talk about is The Impeccable Integrity of Ruby R. Gayatri Rangachari Shah is a Mumbai-based journalist, columnist, and author. She co-authored most recently Change Makers: 20 Women Transforming Bollywood Behind the Scenes. Her writing has appeared in national and international publications like the New York Times and the Hindu, and she's contributing editor at Vogue and Architectural Digest. She covers a wide variety of subjects, including culture, gender, design, and education, and has profiled several leading figures across the world. Gayatri was India head at the New York-based Tina Brown Live Media, which was responsible for putting together the globally rebound journalistic summit, Women in the World. She's a graduate of Mount Holyoke College and Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you, Gayatri and Moni, for being with us today and making the time from your busy schedules and across time zones to be here. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to hand it over to Moni, who is a kindly agreed to read for us from her new novel. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you uh, for inviting me. This is such a huge pleasure. And these are the things which have kept me going the whole of this year because we've been in various forms of lockdown since March. So it's such a delight to be here with you. And um, as I said, thank you very much. And Gayatri, look forward to chatting with you. So the new book is uh, The Impeccable, Impeccable Integrity of Ruby R, which came out in December. <clears throat> it's it's an, a standalone novel. It has nothing to do with the butterfly. Uh, but it's again like the rest of my work, uh, um, social observation and uh, social commentary um, with a little bit of humor. Okay, so I'll read you the first um, page or so from this. <clears throat> I want you, he growled. Under the full force of his blazing gaze, a tide of heat whooshed up Ruby's neck and flooded her cheeks. I need you, said Seth. Huck. Come. His commanding tone drowned out Ruby's habitual caution. Almost as if sleepwalking, she was about to rise shakily to her feet when abruptly he looked away. Sweeping the ascending tiers of the lecture hall, his searchlight gaze scanned the hall. Rows of college students leaned forward in their seats, staring at him in open mouth fascination. I need you to join hands with me. I need you to come forward and shake up our country, your country, my country, our country to restore our self-respect, our dignity, so that no nation ever looks down on us again. I need you to help revive our honor, rebuild our spine. I need you to help me share a just society, to shape a just society, an equal society, where a poor man can walk with his head high, with his head held high, where corrupt officials and cruel leaders live in fear of their lives, and where every man, no matter how rich, how influential, can be held accountable. I need you to help me build that bright, shining future. Come, his voice had been ascending gradually. Now he roared out a single word, yes. A hundred odd students leapt to their feet and thundered, yes. To the sound of deafening applause, some of the boys in the audience vaulted over the desks to reach them, to grab his hands, thump his back and embrace him. The girls' faces flushed and eyes sparkling clapped and clapped. Seif stood still arms outstretched, head flung back, allowing their adulation to wash over him. Doesn't Seth look like Kate Winslet at the prow of the Titanic? 
seated in the third row of the lecture hall, Kiran whispered into Ruby's ear. And that cheapster jazz, she nodded at their batchmate who had organized the event. Just look at the cringy ways all over Sam. It reminds me of my dog, Shiba, how she used to greet me and my brother when we came home from school. Sometimes she'd get so excited, she'd pee a little. I think we should stop there, otherwise I'll give away the whole plot. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Muni. No, you won't give away the whole plot. And I can say that uh, this book was ju just unput downable. So thank you so much for writing it. It was, uh, it's, it's really a, a very enjoyable and uh, very perceptive read, I might add. So I wanted to start by asking you about uh, the idea for the book. How did, how did that come about? So, Gayatri, a couple of things happened. Uh, you know, um, when some couple of years now, Two, three years ago now, I was sitting watching television and the um, Harvey Weinstein story broke. And I was so captivated by that. And I was thinking about that, about how this man who is so powerful and so important in the particular world that he moves in, so influential, and who has the ability to make and break so many careers. Um, if something like this was to happen with a person like that in Pakistan or in India, in the subcontinent, basically, how would it play out? Uh, would there be any repercussions? Would he be held to account? Would anybody speak up for the women uh, against him? Um, and then at the same time, when I started thinking about it, I thought to myself, in which world in Pakistan would this be set? Would it be set in the world of film? But in Pakistan, the film industry after General Ziaul Haq was dead, sort of uh, dealt a kind of death blow. It's still, um, it's sort of come alive a little bit again, but it's still not that important as yet in, for people. Um, modeling world, that's the kind of place where also you see a lot of abuse of power with young girls. I thought that wouldn't um, work because it's too niche a place, too niche a uh, uh, section of society. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I began to understand that it would have to be in politics because politics is a big enough um, 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 arena for people to be captivated by a story like that. Uh, would have resonance in peop normal people's lives as well. Um, so I, that's how I started thinking about it uh, as a, a story of, of abuse in, in politics. And then when I started thinking of politics, I thought I can't write this story uh, at this time without bringing in populism. Um, because as a, um, a reviewer said about my book in, in India, it's that other big viral story in Pakistan, populism. And, um, uh, and in India. And I immediately began to think that I have to bring in these themes. And it sort of came together, it kind of coalesced, all my different ideas came together. And also I wanted to write about celebrity and the lure of celebrity um, right. and how we are completely blinded by it. And it becomes such an important aspect of our lives, particularly in social media and people who follow social media and you know the big Instagram accounts, the big Twitter accounts and how politics is, is conducted through Twitter. Right, and did you write the book uh, through lockdown? What was that process like? Or was it, was it sort of finished earlier uh, than that? You know, the, the, uh, it always seems to people that it's probably just been written and, and you see it within a month of it being, uh, being written, but publishing is a very lengthy process. So you have to give a book in almost a year before it actually hits the bookshops. So I finished it in uh, 2019. So around August, September, 2019. And then, you know, the edits began and, and various sort of rewrites and, and um, different ideas came to me. I had a completely different ending. I changed the ending completely. Um, I, um, yeah, I tightened it. I made it more concise. Um, so all those kind of things. I'm dying to know what your ending was, but I don't want to be spoiler. So because some people have not read the book, obviously. Yeah. So uh, not, I have to have that offline conversation with you on how you change the ending. So 2020 didn't, didn't keep you as busy with this book. Is that right? No, I had to do all the edits through 2020. Okay. So, and you yes. know, the, the book touches upon so many topics as you yourself have said, of course, in our part of the world, politics is something that we as a society are obsessed with. But you know, you you sort of managed to wrap in politics, gender, the Me Too movement, as you as you just touched upon Harvey Weinstein, you know, press freedom, class, privilege, and of course the power of social media. So, how were you able to pack so much in? I think um, because of um, the protagonist, who she is, and where she comes from, that took care of the class angle of it, and then her 
interests and her uh, expertise such as it is. Uh, that took me into social media. And then she is in the world of politics. She gets employed as a social media coordinator. Um, and so that kind of neatly brought in all of those aspects. And once she's in the in, in a work environment, the rest follows. And it's a, it's a predominantly male work environment and a very kind of macho place right. where she is working. So all of those things, I was able to explore those because of who she is and where she goes to work and what work she does. So they all kind of came together there. And of course, the she that you're talking about is Ruby Rock. And it's, uh, you know, it's interesting because she works in a kind of an She's, she's heading this, this social media cell. So she has some amount of agency. And of course her boss is a woman. She has a, a, another woman who's now working with her. So there is this kind of this sense that there might be some progressiveness in this particular mm. uh, office environment, but then you sort of unfold, the story unfolds and then you realize uh, that it is in fact very macho. But you know, Moni, you have talked about how characters write their own story. Is that how Ruby, uh, Ruby's character kind of came alive to you? Yes, yes, uh, it did. Because Ruby feels aggrieved. You know, Ruby has a sense of uh, resentment. Uh, right. She feels that she has been treated unfairly in the world. And she, uh, not that anybody else has done it to her, but because of, you know, her, uh, her father's death. I'm not giving much away because you find that out in the first chapter. Um, her father has died. He's died suddenly because of his death. Um, they have suffered a, um, a setback and not just emotionally, but financially as well. So they are not as well off as they used to be. And a lot of their old friends, etc. therefore have deserted them and they're struggling. And she feels this is um, a demotion very acutely. She also resents the way her family, friends and, and also um, uh, relatives have um, um, abandoned them. Um, and so I, I have found quite a lot, if, you know, when I've been following Brexit, when I've been looking at Trump, when I've been looking at Imran Khan, I've been looking at Modi's rise, um, all of these leaders play upon a sense of grievance in the population to divide them, right? To divide them, to make them feel that there are other people who are um, exploiting them and that they are their saviors and that they are their uh, spokesmen. Whereas in fact, they themselves are extremely privileged people uh, by nature either of their education or of their social class or their political support uh, and the way that their party pushes them or because of other vested interests behind them. Um, and the, the fiction that they manage to propagate and um, uh, push among uh, the public is that we are your saviors, we are um, your um, uh, spokespeople, we are your sympathizers, and these other people, they are your enemies. And it's a kind of um, us and them then that, that, that forms in, in their minds. And so uh, with Ruby, she feels this very keenly, uh, and she's exploited very, very carefully and very subtly so that she begins to believe this narrative as well. I'm actually going to ask you a question about how, you know, how hard is it for you to write female characters versus male characters? Because, you know, we come from a place where I think from a very young age, we're told this is for girls and this is for boys or mm. things like that. So how do you go about constructing your characters and, you know, deciding whether your protagonist is going to be a woman, going to be a man? How do you write your characters? You know, usually I find it easy. I must be uh, honest, I find it easier to write women characters. Um, I probably, because I have an insight <laughs> due to my own gender. Um, but I, uh, I try and be fair to men, you know, I don't want to write uh, caricatures. So I try, in, in this book in particular, I was very um, concerned that the male characters did not come across as uh, hugely exploitative from the outset, that they did have some sort of features which were um, uh, positive. Um, and I wanted to um, pull Ruby in slowly because Ruby is quite uh, an intelligent person. She's an educated woman. She's also quite sophisticated and she's idealistic. For a person like her to believe in the self hug, she has to be, um, she has to be almost in a sense, you know, you have to put, put a spell on her and gently, slowly, carefully sort of pull her in. Um, and I wanted that to happen in the book. 
so therefore the male characters and the female characters had to play off each other and in order to do that i had to um keep some things back the whole time but actually it's a good segue thank you for asking that question nishita because i wanted to ask you about this character sef huck who is on one level very seductive and very charismatic um and you know we can see uh shades of people in him that we know from real life so moni uh, i know that you have talked about how he's a composite of different individuals and if you could talk to us a little bit about who those individuals are that you sort of have 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 based this character on loosely so i wanted to make him charismatic i wanted also for people um to have a sense of familiar familiarity with him um so when he comes out onto the public scene they should feel that they know him you know i was very i was very intrigued by how uh, trump was received mm. people felt that they knew him already because of um uh, um the apprentice, apprentice yeah, yeah the apprentice right. and because of his high sort of uh, uh visibility on the social scene but mainly because of the apprentice and because he had been beamed into their sitting rooms you know they felt that they knew this guy uh that he wasn't um um somebody who was kind of you know far away etc in in a so the people for example living in texas uh in a small town in texas felt that they knew him as well as people in new york who were meeting him on a day to day basis because they felt that they were seeing him as he really was of course he wasn't like that but because right. it was a reality show they felt that they knew him because they knew him well and so the brand was already there by the time you know he came on on the scene so i wanted something like that and i thought how can i create that brand and then i thought i'd give him a uh, a past as a film star and therefore that would have a certain allure and so people when they saw him they would recognize him immediately and that sort of glamour would be around him for that reason and then i gave him a a television program so he became a reality star as well so they felt now they know him not because he's playing a role but because he's being himself um and uh they felt that they knew him entirely because of those things and the third thing so i looked at you know i looked at amita bachchan i looked at trump i looked at boris johnson so boris johnson you know says to everybody call me boris you know i'm your friend call me boris for first name terms you know so that the way people get through to people you know the way imran khan talks about uh, tabdili you know that i'll fix the country in 3 months he told us i right. get rid of corruption in 3 months i will get i will bring in more money than you can ever imagine in 3 months money will pour into the country in 3 months everybody will have a job in 3 months um you know those kind of um those kind of uh, promises very seductive promises so the charisma the um the way he speaks um the background the celebrity all of these came from these kind of sources and you know it's interesting um this this the character that you painted of ruby as a quintessential modern woman in terms of her aspirations in terms of her desires how she's not afraid to voice her opinions but she as you mentioned earlier she also cares about how she's perceived and she's on very conscious of her social standing and class mm. do you think that that these are very specific concerns of young women in our part of the world because uh you know where the male gaze is so strong along with class which is also so strong hmm. well you know patriarchy is very strong in our part of the world and whenever a woman has uh, you know it's it's obviously it's it's everywhere but in uh, in our part of the world it is more dominant so that when a woman comes uh, out into uh, the public sphere she immediately becomes a target in many ways so for instance you know there are some things now it happens in the west as well but there are some things which are now uh, you can't do as easily in the west or it's you know some things have some some arguments have moved on whereas in pakistan and india they haven't so for example if there is a uh, if the woman is raped anywhere in 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 pakistan or india outside her home the first question is why did she leave the home you know what was she wearing why was she alone why did you go out at that time all of that shows that a woman is responsible and is guilty for her you know blaming the victim so um when ruby comes and and works in this environment in um in a very political and male dominated environment she feels also that she 
uh, you remember she's a feminist and she's an idealist and she wants to make a difference. There are a lot of young Pakistani women, modern young Pakistani women who want to, um, it, you know, they're ambitious as well. They want to make a difference to their society, but they also want to create a space for themselves. Right. And Ruby is one such person and, and Farah is one such person as well. And Uzma is another person. So there are these three young women, all of whom are wanting to make a place for themselves. And um, it's very, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of Uzmas and Rubis and um, um, Farahs in Pakistan at the moment. You know, there are, uh, when I started journalism, there were very few. But now with the explosion of media and, and social media, et cetera, there are hundreds of women like that working in, in, um, in the media, in businesses, in, in public sector, uh, in the uh, civil service. Um, all of them have to struggle every day because of the entrenched kind of um, attitudes and that, as you call it, the male gaze, et cetera. Right. They need to negotiate their space and their, uh, their interaction. But they, you know, they are making a difference. And, uh, we, and every um, woman who manages to be a success, she carves out a path for somebody else to follow her. Absolutely. And you know, what's interesting about this novel is that you put a woman at the center of a social media environment, which as we know, is filled with vitriol, especially towards women. So was it very, was it important uh, for you to have uh, a woman shoulder that responsibility? Um, I didn't set it out as such to show what happens to women. I wanted to talk more about how social media changes our, I really do believe it changes the kind of um, networking in our brains, you know. Uh, it changes what becomes acceptable, your, your um, tolerance. Uh, of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable becomes greater the more you are on social media. You know, you see um, what used to be considered abuse is now just kind of um, is, is standard. It's normalized. It's completely normalized. And, and the way women are targeted in particular, but men too, men are also you know, received death threats. I was listening yesterday to a podcast of Dr. Fauci uh, in, um, on the Daily in the New York Times uh, podcast. And he said he received death threats from March last year until February this year. And Sorry. so did his family, I think, his family. And, and his wife and his yeah. wife and his children and everybody. And, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, even he's a scientist, right? Right, right. So he w it wasn't as though he was saying anything which was his own opinions or, you know, he was just giving you the data. So it's interesting because, you know, as a communications tool, we are seeing that social media's power and influence um, is growing day by day. In India, of course, we have state authorities trying to enforce, enforce curbs on how citizens criticize the government, which is getting some blowback. And of course, in the US, Donald Trump has, you know, been banned from various platforms. I mean, do you, I mean, given these most recent developments, your book is so timely. You know, it's a, it, you, I don't think you could have timed it any better uh, because it's sort of a kind of a, a parable to what's happening in the real world. Mm. Did you anticipate that? No, no. <laughs> I, I knew one thing though. I knew that the way politics, social media has changed the way politics is, is, is conducted now, particularly after Donald Trump you know, how the way he used it. And the, also the way, you know, uh, social media is used by the Pakistan that he can serve in, in, in uh, our part of the world. And in yours, I think the Bhakts are very, uh, um, very active. So the, to shut people down, to bully them into silence and into submission, to intimidate, to, to frighten, to, um, um, to divide, you know, that, that is the, the um, agenda. When I started off, I didn't, I, I knew that was there, but I didn't know that, you know, this would happen with Trump uh, or that, you know, finally, um, of course, in 2016, don't forget, we also saw through Facebook how through, through Russian interference in the, uh, in, in the election, how whole elections can be manipulated. Uh, we saw it in Brexit as well, how Brexit was manipulated. Um, so I've only touched, I think, this, the, 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 the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to this and will continue, I think. So Moni, how do you yourself deal with trolls? 
Are you trolled? And if so, how do you cope? I'm not trolled so much, but I think I will be after this book is published in Pakistan. <laughs> um, I, uh, what do I do? I block. I don't think there's much point in trying to engage with them because people don't want to listen to facts and they don't want to listen to your argument. They just want to abuse um, and to silence you. So I don't want to be silenced, but I don't want to engage unnecessarily with people who are never going to um, you know, see my point of view. And also because I don't want, I don't have so much time, you know? There's so many millions of lunatics in the world. That's true. That is true. So are you, uh, I mean, you just sort of uh, mentioned that, are you uh, waiting for some uh, reactions when this book hits the shelves in Pakistan? Well, I hope there won't be. I hope there won't be, but you know, who knows? Who knows? Um, the book is a departure from your previous ones. Here the satire exists, but it's, I think, much more subtle, obviously. How different was it to write this compared to your earlier, earlier ones? Um, you know, I, my very first book was also very different. It's The End of Innocence, and it's set in 1971, and it has an eight-year-old girl as a protagonist. Um, so that too was a, a, was a different kind of book to the butterfly books. And then again, I wrote three butterfly books on uh, at, at uh, uh, you know one after the other, and now this one. Um, so what is difficult, um, Gathri, is creating a um, uh, an imaginary world. You know that that world that exists in that office where right. Ruby works. I had to enter into that state of mind. You have to. I had to do a bit of reading. I had to try and understand how she would be. There are several. You know, I made several attempts at it, and then kept going back and changing things. Initially, Ruby had a younger sister um, and uh, she was having a, a relationship with somebody else who was very powerful in the party. And then I thought, no, this is not working. So you're cutting back, you're changing and you have to um, keep your uh, main characters constantly uh, in sight. Um, and that, that was a bit difficult. It was difficult creating this world because it's not a world that I know very well myself. It's, it was guesswork, it was making things up, it was um, understanding a way of, of thought which is not mine. Uh, you know, the butterfly books, I, I, I write as an insider. Right. But here I wasn't an insider. So, um, you know, you start, I, I, so that brings up a couple of questions around the whole writing process, but let me start by um, uh, asking you about how you develop a writing voice, because, you know, your journey started as a columnist in the newspaper, and of, as familiar with your career, if you could just tell us a little bit about that and how um, the kind of the concept for the butterfly came up and then, and then how you sort of developed a writing voice, because, uh, one thing that we find about you is that you and I mentioned this, your dialogues and everything on the page is just so effortless. I wish it was. I wish it was. There's so much effort involved. Um, so oh, I uh, um, came back from university and I thought I would work in the development sector and I began working in an environmental organization. Um, but I found the work very dull and it was very, uh, you know, the environmental movement hadn't really taken off in Pakistan at that time. And so I was working in a very small office with two or three people and um, all very um, uh, sort of committed and dedicated people, but still it was a very small environment. And I had been away for five years. I'd been at school in England and I'd been at university, came back and I needed uh, to meet new people. I needed to make my own place again here and, and to, um, big, you know, to be part of something bigger. So after working there for about a year, I decided I should move. And at that time, um, the Friday Times had just been set up. It's a weekly newspaper. Um, and it was the first independent weekly from Pakistan. And I was offered a job there. So I went to work there uh, and I started writing features, which I enjoyed very much. Um, and then I was offered this a column and I, write, I wrote a, a column about, I was on the women's page in the beginning and I had to write about the life of a young working woman in Pakistan. So I wrote about myself um, and I wrote that column for about a year or two and it was called, uh, by the way. Um, but then I began to feel a bit bored by it and also because I felt that I was giving away too much of my own life because it was all based on myself. And, um, and this is the years before um, the time before Facebook and Instagram, etc. Now it's very obviously. What, you're... Are we talking, what years are we talking about, Modi? So we're talking early 90s. 
early 90s. Yeah, years and years and years ago. Um, and um, the concept of actually writing about yourself or doing photographs of yourself was quite sort of weird at that time. Um, and there was such a thing known as privacy, which no longer <laughs> exists, obviously. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I felt that I was invading my own privacy. And I'd said to my editor that I don't want to do this anymore. So he said, yeah, but you built up your readership and those women uh, still look forward to your columns. You've got to write some, something else. So then I, as you know, I, I've documented this in, in, in the introduction to Diary of a Social Butterfly as well, but I had gone to a party, a lunch party in Lahore in the winter and we were, I was queuing to go to the um, buffet table and there were these two ladies who were speaking to each other who were sort of chatting in, in front of me. It's quite cold and there was this one woman who was wearing a chiffon sari and um, she was kind of indeterminate age and she had long blow dried hair and a sleeveless blouse and things. And then there was another lady behind her wearing an enormous shirt she was quite squat and fat and anyway so she was saying to the other one I had two already before but I thought you know and it's just so nice to wear such a big shatush this one is seven yards the other one was five yards and I have a so she was asked the other woman she said and she said I don't wear maids effect so immediately I thought this is the voice these are the people this is the society this is what I have to write and so I began writing the diary of a social butterfly. And then I formed this character. I, I created this character. And then she had to have a kind of an ecosystem. So she had a husband who was her foil uh, because I couldn't get her to say all these things and not check it, you know? So people would think that I really believe those things. So I had to have a voice which is constantly saying to her, nay, nay, essay, nay, nay, essay. And then um, she had a mother, she had a mother-in-law, she had an auntie, she had cousins, she had family, she had friends. So I created that whole, whole sort of thing. And then it took off and then it just happened. And the more I wrote, the easier it became because I entered into her consciousness. And uh, sometimes I feel that I am myself the butterfly now <laughs> because she and I have become one over time. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so is it, how, is it how, how long does that take you? I mean, you say, I know it's not without effort. Is it, is it, um, and it's not just butterfly, it's also even Ruby, uh, you know, or your other guy. Is it, is it sort of a long drawn out process? What is, what is that like? So, you know, writing fiction is, takes time. It really takes time because the only way that I can do it, I can't, um, I'm not one of those writers who plans out the whole plot before. I just have a vague idea in my mind that this is a character I wanted to write about. And this is the protagonist and this is the antagonist. That is all I have in my mind. And I will start writing and they're not even fully formed. And I will start writing a small thing to begin with. It may not even be some, the beginning of the book. It may be in the middle of the book, um, but it, it's just, uh, a way in, you know, it's like a lane into a, uh, into a neighborhood. Um, and um, it's like a lane into a walled city. You enter from one side and then you go around and then slowly you understand how it all connects and what is where and how it leads, one thing leads to another. Um, and that's how um, I, I write. And it's a slow process because I don't know where I'm going. And quite a, long, a lot of the time I go into dead ends. And then I have to come back and I have to find another path because it's not working. Um, and the other thing is because I, as I said to you, uh, my characters show me the way as well. Um, there are some things when I'm writing it and as Ruby's developing slowly, I will think to myself, Ruby wouldn't say this, Ruby wouldn't do this. And right at the, you know, I said to you that I had another big ending before. I had an ending which I had in, in a way kind of forced onto Ruby and onto the thing because I wanted it to end that particular way. But when I read it, I thought, oh, this doesn't make sense. This Ruby wouldn't do this. Farah wouldn't do this. The mother wouldn't do this. This is, this is not right. And so I stopped and I thought, what would Ruby do? What would Farah do? What would I do if I was in Farah's shoes? What would I do if I was in Ruby's shoes? And then that kind of allowed me to write. Um, but I, uh, before, you know, I, I have a couple of more questions. I'm also cognizant of the time. Moni, you know, you have this jaundiced eye on society and on, and on politics in our part of the world. Do you think of yourself as cynical about politics and its transformative powers in South Asia? Not at all. Not at all. I, 
You know, I believe that a lot of the time we are ill served by our leaders. A lot of our political leaders are people who have let us down. Um, either because they have not been able to resist the lure of, of uh, enriching themselves or because they have allowed um, power to become the main uh, objective uh, for themselves and, and have allowed that to, oh, and they have sowed division and they have created, um, they have heightened injustice as opposed to trying to reduce injustice. But that said, there are a lot of activists. I can't say about India so much because I don't know it well enough. But in Pakistan, there are so many such inspiring activists. So I don't know if you've heard the name of Asma Jahangir. Today's her um, uh, today's her death anniversary. Um, she was such an inspiring woman. Benazir, for all her faults, was an inspiring woman. She was an incredibly brave woman. Um, we had people like uh, Molana Adi. He was an amazing man. Then we have uh, Iqbal Ahmed, who was a, a um, an academic and uh, an academic and a, a journalist um, and a writer and and uh, and an activist. Um, incredible people, uh, Dr. Pervez Hoodboy, um, and you know it, it's the it's the existence of people like this who keep on fighting, who keep on trying, who keep on um, and and many politicians as well. You know, grassroots politicians um, who keep on and on and on um, struggling. That gives me great uh, confidence and it gives me great hope. Um, and I, I'm not cynical about Pakistan. I may be cynical about certain people and certain vested interests, um, but I'm not cynical about the ordinary people and their, uh, their ability right. to transform so I don't themselves. Know if you know this. Well. Yeah, I, I lived there for uh, five years in the late 80s. And uh, I have to say that uh, it's the people, it's the people who give you uh, so much uh, sort of uh, hope. And uh, yeah. that's why whenever- And particularly about, women, Gayatri, you know, when, particularly yes. women, because women- yes. Women are unlike, unbelievable. Uh, because, you know, unlike men, they can't take things for granted and they don't have power and they don't have privilege and they don't have uh, authority. They've got, to, they've got to work for everything. They've got to struggle for everything. They've got to struggle to be heard even. So they, I think, are, are, are actually a hope for the future rests with women. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, um, you live in London, we know that, and but you visit pa Pakistan frequently, except of course in the last year because of uh, the pandemic, um, and you're so rooted there. Um, you know, Imran Khan came to power on a platform of change on this Naya Pakistan platform. Are mm. things different today? They're pretty much the same. If anything, they've got worse. There is, you know, the government is very incompetent. Um, it is, um, you know, he said that he would bring about financial transformation. That has not happened. Not just that, but um, inflation is rampant. Poverty has increased. Unemployment has skyrocketed. Um, and, and, you know, his big sort of platform was corruption, his anti-corruption drive. Um, he himself may be um, uh, clean, but he's surrounded by um, many very... Um, um, questionable people with, with uh, interests in, in, in a lot of, uh, you know, who have presided over big scandals, sort of wheat scandal, sugar scandal, et cetera. Um, I've been allowed to make a lot of money. Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't see much change there. Mm, and I was reading actually my, um, I have a bunch of friends still from high school I keep in touch with. And apparently there was some crazy idea to uh, mortgage or sell F9 Park in Islamabad. Yeah. Because, of, you know, so I think, and then I saw, I got this amazing video of this really sort of this old, uh, this elderly woman who was screaming and shouting and saying that we are not dead. We won't allow this to happen. And she was so, <laughs> she was so incredible, you know, in, in the way that she spoke with such force. More, so, power yes. to her. More yeah. power to her. But they've, thankfully, Imran Khan has had the right uh, reaction to that. He's decided not to do that, not to mortgage that, but to mortgage Islamabad Club, which is where all the rich people gather. Um, so I'm going to ask you uh, one uh, more question, then we'll open it up to the audience. But I, you know, this you mentioned this, the plight of women in the subcontinent, uh, which is obviously truly still abysmal. 
But you know, you always have these strong independent women as your protagonists. Um, even, 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 even the social butterfly character is, you know, she's, she's, she's kind of emblematic of a particular milieu of society, but in her own way, she also has agency. Um, and she they speaks her mind, certainly. <laughs> absolutely. And they negotiate this inherent patriarchy surrounding them. Is this one of the main motivations of your writing to project these strong female uh, voices? I, I imagine so. But you know, Gayatri, I was, somebody else asked me this question as well recently in an interview. And um, I said to them something which is, you know, which I wasn't particularly aware of before, but now when I think of it, maybe that's why I do this, is because I grew up in a household where women spoke their minds. My, both my grandmothers spoke their minds. My nani, my mother's mother, had five daughters, uh, of whom my mother was one, and she raised all of them to be empowered, to speak their minds, to hold their own, to express themselves um, and to have a say in what happened to them and to their children. Uh, and they in turn gave that uh, feeling to all their daughters. So to me, it seems entirely natural and normal to speak out, to express myself, to, um, to um, voice opinions which may or may not even be popular uh, or you know, um, proper as they say in Pakistan. Um, so, I don't know whether that was my motivation or whether that was my background that I was channeling, but uh, I don't think I could have written any other way. So it's not necessarily conscious, conscious. No, no, not really. Um, I mean, obviously you make a choice, right? You do make a choice as to whether you want to write uh, Actually, I come to think of it, in none of my books do I have a, a, a woman who is completely silent and who doesn't, who is oppressed. Uh, must be a choice somewhere. Um, unselfconsciously, in my unselfconscious mind, maybe that's where, in my unconscious mind. Um, okay, I'm now going to open it up to the audience. So uh, let me start with the first question. What is the biggest critique of your work that you have heard or read? How do you make peace with those who don't agree with your writing? Um, you know, it's a very big world and there are lots and lots and lots of writers in this world and there are lots and lots and lots of books in this world. If people don't like my books, luckily they have a lot of choice. They can go and read anything else they like. Um, so I am going to carry on writing what I want and um, people are free to read or not read as they wish. I don't insist that everybody should read my work. Um, and yes. with regard to with criticism, it is absolutely their right to criticize. Uh, they can, you know, they can say what, you know, whatever they please, it is their, their wish. Um, uh, and also, you know, I can't, I can't please everybody. I'm aware of that. Uh, everybody has their own taste, everybody has their own likes and dislikes, and um, they are free to express those. So it's, you know, it's, it's sort of like um, you said, all, uh, I heard you at another interview, it's like giving birth. So do you, do, you, do you have to develop a thick skin after you, you know, put something that like a labor of love to the world and, uh, and then have that criticism? Do writers have to develop that thick skin? You do, but even before you readers get to read your book, you get, it has to go to uh, publishers, right? Your agent sells them or uh, sends them on to publishers and the publishers write back to you and tell you they don't like this. They don't want to publish this for this reason or that reason or that this is not their thing or this is the, you know, the butterfly was also, you know, many people said they didn't want to publish it. It wasn't their thing at all. So you have to, um, you know, even before it gets to readers, you have to uh, um, acclimatize yourself to, um, uh, accepting uh, rejections and to accepting um, um, differences of opinion. Mm. Right. So actually, that brings up another question, and then I'll go back to the audience questions. Do you find, as a as as a writer, do you face constraints uh, from publishers, especially you know you're a South Asian woman living in the West, um, mm. and then and then you're kind of writing is that a burden do you feel uh this sense of obligation about having to explain your society explain the voice you know all of that 
And those are the kind of things that they like in the West. They want, you know, if it's a brown person who's writing a, a, a book, it, it's a completely different kind of expectation that they have to a white writer. Um, so, you know, if you're a Muslim in particular, it seems to me that in the last 20 years since 9-11 happened, or 10 years, sorry, since 9-11 happened, uh, you know, it's, uh, oh, 20 years, yeah, sorry. Uh, we've had to explain why this happened to the rest of the world. You know, how can I explain it? I'm, I'm a liberal. I, I, I know nothing about the Taliban. I know nothing about extremism, but the expectation has been that everybody, uh, um, uh, any sort of writer from the Muslim world has to engage with this subject, has to explain to the world why it happened, how it happened and, and what their position is on it. Um, if you're from South Asia, you have to explain why there are slums, why there's a caste system, why there's injustice, why there's poverty. All these books have to be heavy, they have to be weighty, they have to be serious, they have to be, and they have to explain our part of the world to the West, to the Western reader. Um, Western readers, on the other hand, can write about anything they want. They can write to be published, they can write fantasy, they can write about a boy wizard, they can write about um, they can write about vampires, they can write about, you know, and it's fine. But a black writer uh, writing from a country like Nigeria has to write about, um, has to write about race, has to write about poverty, has to write about the position of women in their society. Somebody from South Asia, uh, South Africa will have to write about AIDS, will have to write about, you know, as, as I was talking to a black writer the other day, and she said to me that, uh, I've always wanted to write a love story set in an office in, in a city in, in Johannesburg, let's say. But no, I can't do that because I have to write about poverty and I have to write about AIDS and I have to write about tribalism and I have to write about daily injustices because that's what uh, publishers want from there. Well, let's hope things change as there are more, uh, more people writing uh, you know, from our part of the I world and so. certainly more people of color writing. Uh, okay, another question. How do you, uh, what do you think will, tr will be the trigger for real social change in Pakistan um, in spe specifically and also South Asia overall? There used to be a writer, um, he died two, three years ago. His name was Intazar Hussain. Um, and he uh, had uh, migrated from India at the time of partition and he used to live in Lahore. And he once said to me in Pakistan, he said that um, I, uh, ever since I've come to live in this country, he died, I think in his nineties, about three, four years ago. And he said, ever since I've come to live in this country, I have seen the growth of two particular sects in Pakistan, you know, who weren't very powerful then, but have rapidly risen and have acquired very strong voices and, and a lot of power. And those two sects are one are the mullahs and the other are women. And I said to him, but isn't that a contradiction in terms? And he said, I don't know if it's a contradiction, but it's a dialectic. Mm. And that is what is going to happen. That is going to be the future of Pakistan will be decided by the conflict between these two, because there, you know, there is going to be a confrontation. And um, I think in many ways that's going to be happen in India as well. You see more and more young women entering uh, um, education, being educated much more highly uh, entering the civil service. At least that's what's happening in Pakistan. I, and I think it's happening in India as well, entering the media, entering public service, entering, you know, in, in spheres like this. About 20 years ago, you would only have seen men in the, uh, you know, uh, in such sort of fora. Um, the other thing which is, I think, happening and is going to be a very big factor, uh, which we have not yet come to terms with, but which will also require regional cooperation, um, and we have not yet thought about that, is climate change. I think that's going to really cause a lot of um, um, tumult in our part of the world. A, because we have such enormous population, um, many of whom are uh, farmers uh, living very close to the edge. Um, any change in the monsoon, for instance, or any uh, the melting of the glaciers, etc. You know, the COVID has been such an eye opener. Uh, we've been, we have been arming ourselves to the teeth for the last seventy years, building bombs and and missiles, etc. And and when the killer comes, it it comes into your homes, you know, without you even being aware of it. It's such an right. irony, and all those sort of you know uh, stacks of, of of weapons have not. We helped us. Mm. 
Well said. Well, very well said, Moni. Um, do you, uh, how do you write and what is a typical writing day for you? And what advice would you give upcoming writers? Um, different days are different. Um, uh, I try and write every day. I try and get to my desk by about 10 a.m. and try and stay there till about 4 to 5 p.m. Um, I, I try and write every day. You know, the aim is to write a thousand words, but often that doesn't happen. Um, often if I even get 300 good words, I'm thrilled to bits. Um, I think my advice, that I only have two pieces of advice. One is to read as widely as you can uh, if you want to be a writer. Uh, that is the first thing. The second thing is that when you do decide to write, um, just go for it sit down and go for it. It's a very lonely job. It's a very time consuming job. And it's a, also a job which is filled with self doubt and with fear and uh, with um, disappointment because it, you know, not everything doesn't go your way at all, um, but stick with it um, and try and, and build a certain degree of confidence and try and, and do the work every day whether you write even 100 words a day, write every day. Uh, what are you writing next, Moni? I don't know, Gyatri. I thought I would write a book set in England. And I was, you know how the brown people are always being looked at by white people. And, you know, the white gaze is always telling us who we are and what we, what we are about. I wanted to turn the, the gaze and tell white people what we think of them, how they appear to us. <laughs> You know, and uh, how how sometimes how we find it so bizarre the way they they behave. You know, they're constantly making fun of us and our accents and our uh, and our habits and our you know. And I thought that maybe it's time we I did something to them that way. Um, but I'm still I'm still thinking about it. I haven't yet decided how it will be or what shape it will take. Or indeed, if that is the book that's so. Um, and I'm also working on a butterfly book. Smiling. Sorry? Oh, you are. Yeah, yeah, because You're, you know. You are working on a Because my columns, I keep writing my columns and the last book that came out, I think they ended in 2007, the columns, I, I think so. So I've got, a, no, I've got about seven years of column, 2013, I think I've got about seven years of columns. So uh, I'll just put them together in a, in a collection. Lovely. I, it, I know it used to be syndicated here in India, but I think that stopped. So I hope uh, we'll have the opportunity to be able to read you uh, in the papers once again. Um, I, I know we have about four minutes left and I know Ishita will also want to close. So I am going to ask one very quick question, last question from the audience. And then I have a small Proust questionnaire, very rapid fire. And then I'll hand it to you, Ishita, to do the, the thanks. Um, uh, what was, uh, I guess this is a query, uh, you know, following up on the question, uh, the, the conversation we had around uh, publishing and uh, the publishers. What was the response from the UK publishers to the novel? Were they even willing to consider it since it, since it isn't about terrorism, poverty and race? This one, um, I've had quite a lot of difficulty getting it, you know, uh, published here. Uh, Tender Hooks was published in Britain, um, but this one they feel that this is not something that you know will will have any interest for white readers. So at the moment, my 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 agent is still trying, but um, you know, I have received quite a lot of refusals. They say that this has no, um, this has absolutely no. Um, relevance for them which is which i find quite interesting because as we as you were saying earlier social media is something which is you know and the way it is interacts in politics uh, is something of great interest to the whole world at the moment yeah well i i would i would imagine it would be great for next netflix or any streaming service i think it has sort of universal appeal so you never know okay the proust questionnaire uh moni your favorite prose authors Oh my God, um, you should have reminded me before. Um, I have, I like um, Elizabeth Taylor very much. I like uh, Nancy Mitford a great deal. I like uh, Saadat Hassan Manto enormously. I like Ismut Jukhtai greatly. Um, I enjoy Hilary Mantel. Um, I like Nagib Mahfouz very much. Um, I like um, uh, Daniel Moinuddin's work very much because particularly because it resonates with the kind of place that I come from as well. 
um, enough or more? That's good. That's good. Uh, favorite her heroines in fiction? Ah, uh, favorite heroines in fiction. I think my all-time favorite is this woman called Claudia Hampton, who is the heroine of a book called uh, uh, Tiger. Oh God, I keep forgetting the name. Moon Tiger. Moon Tiger. She um, she's my greatest heroine. Um, who else? I also like um, funny heroines a lot. I like uh, Linda in um, in um, love um, in the pursuit of love. And then there is my favorite monster. She's called uh, Lady Montdor, and she's in Love in a Cold Climate. Both of these books are by Nancy Mitford. Um, Lady Montdor is one of my favorite characters. Um, your favorite qualities in a man? Compassion, kindness. Um, intelligence, humor. Uh, favorite qualities in a woman? Same. Uh, your idea of happiness? These days in particular, to be around a dining table, sharing delicious food with a group of friends and close relatives and laughing. And uh, greatest extravagance? Time, time to waste. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for that. It was really wonderful to chat with you. Ishita, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you both so much for making the time. And uh, I've got so many messages in the in the meantime saying, can I buy this book on Amazon? You can 100% buy it on Amazon India. That's where I got it. Um, I highly suggest you get the um, physical copy because it's that much more fun and that much more comforting in this time. Thank you, Gayatri and Moni, again for this. It's been so wonderful. And I hope you can actually join us in Goa someday soon to do this in person. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.